Well, we've looked at linear inequalities and how to solve them now. Now we're going to move on up to quadratic inequalities. Now there's a little bit more involved here, as you'll see. But let's start out, because it starts out the same way we did with linear inequalities. We start out with a definition of what a quadratic inequality will be. A quadratic inequality. Well, you know, as I said with linear inequalities, a lot of what we do here will be reusing what we learned about quadratic equations. Quadratic inequality in one variable because that's the only kind we look at here, has one of these, once again, standard forms. And as with the linear case, there are four of them. ax squared plus bx plus c less than zero, or, and I'm not going to repeat this, less than or equal to zero, greater than zero, or greater than or equal to zero. So those are the four possible sorts of quadratic inequalities that we'll look at, where, as usual, so that we have a quadratic, a is not 0, and a, b, and c, the coefficients, are, of course, real numbers. So there's the basic definition of a quadratic inequality. Why don't I begin now by showing you an example, simple example, and lead you through the process that we'll use to solve these. So here's our first example. Solve for x, as usual. And the inequality is x squared plus x minus 12 is greater than 0. So this is no longer an equation, remember. This is now an inequality. We want to know where those, what numbers x will make this a number that is greater than 0. So let's lo go ahead and look at a solution. And this will be a model for the kind of solutions that we do with all other quadratics. First, of course, we'll look at this algebraically, as always. And let me rewrite it here. x squared plus x minus 12 greater than 0. And I happen to be lucky again. This will factor nicely, so I'll take my luck where I get it. Lucky factoring here, x plus 4 times x minus 3 is greater than 0. OK, so far, all I've done is an operation that I would have done for solving the equation. I factored the left-hand side. Now, before I continue, I want to note something. Before continuing, observe. For the equation, if this were an equation, if this were not an inequality, if it were an equation, that is to say x plus 4 times x minus 3 equals 0, if this were an equation, well, we can immediately solve this. We have that x is equal to minus 4. That comes from the first term possibly being 0. Or x equals 3 from the second term possibly, the second factor, rather, possibly being 0. Now, we're going to give these two points names. And you'll see why they're given these names in a moment. We'll call these split points, split points. And of course, the question you have at this point is why? What does split have to do with anything? Why does x equal minus 4 and x equal 3 call, call split points? What, after all, do they split? Well, here is the key idea that I'm about to use to finish solving this quadratic inequality. Let me go ahead and lay this out carefully here. Key idea. Now, with this key idea, everything will fall into place. We'll get to use our knowledge about quadratic equations to solve quadratic inequalities. So the idea is this. To solve, and I'll go ahead and use the example we're looking at, say x plus 4 times x minus 3 greater than 0, here's what we'll do. First, we'll find the solutions, solutions, or zeros if you like, to the equation, not the inequality, but the equation, x plus 4 times x minus 3 equals 0, as I did on the previous page. Those points we're calling split points. I haven't told you why yet, but we'll get to that. Now, these numbers that you get, 
which were x minus 4 and x3 in this case. And of course, these will be x-intercepts. These will split, which is the reason for the name, they will split the real line, real number line, into intervals. And what, what's special about those intervals? Well, they're intervals over which either the function up here, which in this case is the x plus 4 times x minus 3 function, is greater than 0, or the x plus 4 times x minus 3 function is less than 0. And that will always hold on those intervals. So here is the key idea. To solve an equation, and it doesn't have to be this one. It can be any equation. This could be any f of x. You find the solutions, or sorry, inequality. I want to solve the inequality. You find the solutions to the equation. And then you use those numbers, the solutions you get, the zeros. And they will split the real line into a number of intervals. On each interval, either the function will be greater than 0 or it will be less than 0. And that will always hold. Now, you should remember that this is correct. Let me bring back a picture that I showed you a while back, this picture. And you notice here that when you have a function like y equals f of x, here it is again snaking through the graph, that the places where it's 0 are where it crosses the x-axis, like these three points. And you also see that in between those points, the function's totally above or it's totally below. There are no more crosses which makes sense, because if it crossed, there'd be yet another point here on the line. So it's always above or it's always below between these three zero points. That is the idea that we're using here. So with those split points in mind, let's go ahead and we'll examine now the function we're looking at, which is x plus 4 times x minus 3, which of course originally was x squared plus x minus 12. Now I'm going to show you how we go about solving this. We want to know where this function is greater than 0. So actually, I can finish this off at the end. I want to know where that's greater than 0. So here's how I'm going to do that. I am going to draw myself here. And let me put it so that I have plenty of room. Draw myself, an example, a piece of the real line. And on that piece of the real line, I will mark the two split points that I found, the minus 4 and the 3. Now notice again, I'm not marking any other points because I don't need them. All I'm interested in are the regions of the real line that these two numbers split the real line in two, one, two, three parts. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see what uh, value the function has on each of these parts. As you saw from the picture before, the function in this region is either totally above or totally below the x-axis, which means it's always positive or it's always negative. Another way to say that is, I can take any point in here, any point below minus 4, put it into the function. Whatever number I get out, if it's positive, the function's always positive here. If it's negative, the function's always negative here. That also goes for each of the other two regions. So what I'm going to do is, uh, right underneath the axis here, I'm going to pick an arbitrary number that is in this region. Not a boundary number, anything in this region. Something simple. So here, I'll pick, say, minus 5. That's a nice, simple number that I know is below minus 4. Between minus 4 and 3, of course, is everybody's favorite number, 0. So I'll put that there. And above 3, I'll pick another easy number, say, 4. OK? I picked those numbers. Now, sometimes these are called test numbers. They, it is irrelevant what number you choose. Because remember, when I put it in the function, I'm only going to be checking whether the function's positive or negative. I don't really care what the value is. Then I'm going to go through and look at each of the factors involved here and see what plus or minus sign they have. So for example, x plus 4. What will be the sign, the plus or minus sign of x plus 4 here? Well, I use the test number, put minus 5 in there. Minus 5 plus 4 is negative. So I'll put that that is negative. That is one of the two factors up here. Let me try the other one now. x minus 3. x minus 3, when I put in negative 5, is negative 8. That's also negative. And therefore, the function f of x, which remember is the product of these two in this problem, is a negative times a negative. And a negative times a negative, as you know, is a positive. So f of x is greater than 0 in this region. OK. At the boundaries, let's go ahead and mark them f of x equals 0. So 
So f of x equals 0 at each of those boundaries. And uh, these, of course, are also the split points. Now let's go ahead and do the same process in the middle. x plus 4. If I put 0 in there, I get 4. That's greater than 0. x minus 3. If I put 0 in there, I get minus 3. That's less than 0. Something that's positive times something that's negative gives you something that is negative. Remember, the function is the product of these two. Here it is right here. Do the same thing over here. x plus 4. Put a 4 in. Of course, that's greater than 0. x minus 3. Put the 4 in. 4 minus 3 is greater than 0. So therefore, positive times positive gives you positive. So now I can see immediately where f of x, the original function, is greater than 0. It's greater than 0 in this region, not including the boundary, and in this region, not including the boundary. If I sort of schematically draw the intervals, I'm talking about that interval and that interval where the open holes indicate that I am not including the minus 4 the minus, or the plus 3. So with that in mind and this picture in front of us, I can immediately write down what the solution is. This region over here is where x is in minus infinity to 4. And this region is where x is in 3 to infinity. So this is the region below 4, not including 4. And this is the region above 3, but not including 3. And these are together, so it's this or this. These are the intervals that are the solution to this original inequality. Now, what should have just look at this? This is the kind of construction you're going to do for yourself. You might modify it. You might simplify it a bit. But this is still the basic idea. OK, with this in mind, let's go ahead and look at a graphical conformation just to get a picture here in this one. You won't need to do this in all of these problems if you're careful. This is, again, the function f of x equals x squared plus x minus 12. The window I'm going to be looking at is minus 6 to 6 by minus 15 to 5. And the graph that I got looked like this. There's my window. And at an axis there and an axis here. And it was a parabola that came down and did something like that. It crossed here at minus 4, as you know, and here at 3. And these are the points, remember, that split. These are these split points, this one and that one. And the regions, remember, are from minus 4 below and 3 above. So we're talking about the curve is above here. It's above for 3 here, uh, greater than 3 and less than minus 4. The curve is obviously above the, the x-axis, or the y equals 0 line. So visually, we see the same thing that we got algebraically. Now, there is a question that should be raised here. What happens if you can't find any split points? Remember how we found sl split points? We took the function, and we set it equal to 0, and we find the zeros. What if there are no real zeros? That's a good question. Probably needs to be addressed here. Question. Suppose f of x is never 0 for any real x. OK, now real x's correspond to x-intercepts. There might be some complex zeros, but we're not interested in those. Suppose x is never 0 for uh, any real x. And as I said, that corresponds to x-intercepts. What if there are no intercepts? How then, how do we determine where the function is greater than 0 or the function is less than 0? Okay, those are the questions we're asking in inequalities. How do we determine those two things if we can't find split points to divide up the real number line? Well, think about it for a moment. If there are no split points, then that means the function is always above the axis or always below the x-axis. Because if it crosses, there'd be a split point. There'd be an x-intercept. Well, that sounds like a theorem. 
And in fact, that's going to be true for everything, not just this quadratic example we just saw, but this will be true for any polynomial. Here's the theorem, and I'll just write it down. It's almost commonsensical. If a polynomial equation, say f of x equals 0, so we're talking about a polynomial equation, if that polynomial equation has no real zeros, now those are x-intercepts, of course, then one of two things happens. Then f of x, the polynomial function in question, is either always positive, that is to say, f of x is always greater than 0, always, for all real numbers, or it is always negative. That is to say that f of x is always less than 0. Well, that solves your problem with, solves your inequality question, of course. All you have to do is, if it has no real zeros, since it is always positive or always negative, the test would be, take a real number, any real number, my choice would probably be 0 most of the time, take any real number, put it into f of x, and see whether the number you get out is positive or negative. And that will tell you about the entire polynomial equation, the polynomial function. So you can test with any real number. And you'll see me do this in a later problem. OK. Because remember, here's that picture again. Remember, the function between x-intercepts is always above and below. If there are no x-intercepts, you might imagine that I'm just looking at a piece in here. There are no x-intercepts. Notice that this function is always above. And if I pick any real number in here, it's going to indicate a positive y value, which will tell me that the function is above. OK, that's the basic idea here. OK, with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and stop with uh, quadratic inequalities and move on to polynomial inequalities of higher degree. I'm doing this by example because there is no standard technique involved here. It's just more practice with split points. Solve for x. This one's a little bit more complicated. x cubed minus 4 greater than or equal to 3x squared plus 5x minus 3. Solution. Now, I'm on, I, I'll show you the algebraic solution as far as I can. You'll see why I can't go any further. What I'm first going to do is get this in standard form, which moves, means move everything over to the left. I also incidentally recognize that this is cubic. So moving everything to the left, I have x cubed minus 4 minus 3x squared minus 5x plus 3 greater than or equal to 0. So now we're in standard form. And I can combine at least, let's see, the two constants here. So I have x cubed minus 3x squared minus 5x minus 1 greater than or equal to 0. And now I'm stumped because this is a cubic. And I don't have any cubic equation solving formulas. I don't have a quadratic formula like a formula like a cubic formula. So I can't solve this by setting it equal to 0. I also don't immediately see any clever factoring that I might do. So what do you do in this case? Well, since we don't have here, although there, one, there is one, it does exist, a cubic formula. Now this is even worse when you get to higher and higher degrees, as you might imagine. Since we don't have a cubic formula here, look at the graph. Now this is a case where having a graphing calculator is extremely valuable. So let's do that. Let's take that function, which was the left-hand side of the standard form. I'll write it out here. x cubed minus 3x squared minus 5x minus 1. Now I'm interested in where that's greater than or equal to 0. And I'm going to look at the graph to help me do that. Now I, my experimentation led me to minus 2 to 5 by minus 18 to 1 as a reasonable picture. Here's what the picture turns out to be. 
There's the window. X-axis is up here. The Y-axis is here. And what I saw in my picture was that this went up, it went down, and then it went up yet again. So there was one, two, three points where it crossed the x-axis. And when I used trace, etc., you may have another function that'll take you directly to x-intercepts. We've seen that before. I got these approximate values. It looked like this one on the left was approximately minus one. This one in the middle was approximately minus 0.23. And this one on the right was approximately 4.23. Of course, I'm truncating these, as we always do. Now, there will be information later when we look at polynomials. If this is really a root, or a zero, minus one, then if I put minus one into this equation, I will get zero. As it turns out, it is. And then we can use that information, with knowledge we'll have later, to factor out a linear factor from here and leave this as a quadratic, which we can solve, times a linear. And then we can actually find the exact values of these two other ones. But we don't have that technique right now. So approximately, I will say, x is in, and I'll write approximately here because there's no good notation for this, approximately in, remember we want where it's greater than or equal to 0, so we want this region in here, including the endpoints, and then from here off to the right. So I guess schematically I could mark this like this or like this. So x is approximately in the interval from minus 1 to minus 0.23, or x is in the approximate interval starting at 4.23 and going to infinity. Now those answers are fairly good. They may not satisfy you because they're not exact, but that may be the best we can do in this case. Okay, that's the last I'm going to do with higher degree polynomial inequalities. Now we're going to go on and look at rational inequalities. With the information we now have from solving these quadratic inequalities and solving higher degree polynomial inequalities, we can move on to solving rational inequalities, where we have polynomials over polynomials, if you recall. And again, I'm going to do this by example, and we'll see a lot of the split point method appear here. So let's look at an example. Example. We'll look at this one in great detail. Solve for x. 4x plus 5, starting with a really simple one, just a linear over a linear, over x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 3. Solution, we can look at an algebraic solution first, as we always tend to do. And later we'll look at some graphical vision. Now with the rational function, which is what this left-hand side is, we want to make sure that we don't divide by 0. So let's just note that the domain of the variable x is, using the set builder notation yet again, all the x and the real numbers such that x is not equal to, well, what would make the bottom 0 here? Minus 2. So we want to make sure that x is not equal to minus 2. Now, what is the next thing we'd like to do? Well, if your instinct is to say, I want to clear fractions, meaning I want to get rid of this denominator, and I, therefore I will multiply both sides by x plus 2. I want to give you a warning. You can't do that without great care. We can't multiply by that x plus 2 because we don't know. Here's the crucial part about inequalities. We don't know the plus or minus sign of x plus 2. Okay, That is the problem. Because you remember, if we multiply both sides of an inequality by a positive number, there's no change in direction. But if we multiply by a negative number, there is a change in direction. 
x plus 2 is a variable expression. We don't know whether it's positive or negative, or if it might change depending on x. So we cannot just multiply both sides by x plus 2. So here's what we'll do instead. Instead, we will move everything to the left and get our standard form, that f of x greater than or equal to 0 form. So I will have 4x plus 5 over x plus 2 minus 3 greater than or equal to 0. So I've moved everything over to the left. Now this standard form of putting things on the left really seems to be a good idea. It avoids a lot of error. OK, on this side I can combine these into a single fraction, which is easy. Uh, 3 needs a denominator of x plus 2. So what I'll do is I'll multiply 3 top and bottom by x plus 2. Is that legal? Sure it is. The only problem would have been division by 0, and that only happens when x is minus 2, and we've eliminated minus 2 from the domain of x. So this is legitimate. Now these two have the same denominator, which is to say x plus 2. And so I can write 4x plus 5 minus 3 times the quantity x plus 2 greater than or equal to 0. Of course, I can simplify that now. And on the top, I have 3x or 4x minus 3x, which is x. 5 minus 3 times 2, 3 times 2 is 6, so that's minus 1. The bottom is x plus 2, and that will be greater than or equal to 0. And of course, this left-hand side I will denote as the function in question for us to look at uh, split points. So this is the simplified version of the problem we started with. There is a 0 on the right instead of the original 3. And now we have a rational expression greater than or equal to 0. Regarding this. Let's make a couple of observations. In order to find split points for this, I want to know when this entire expression is either positive or negative, and therefore I want to know exactly when this expression is 0, because that will be the boundaries between positive and negative. So let me write down an observation here. Observe that the plus or minus signs of the top and bottom the top and bottom, of course, are polynomials. The plus and minus signs of the top and bottom polynomials of our f of x, which since it's on the other page, I'll rewrite it here, x minus 1 over x plus 2, determine together the overall plus or minus sign of f of x, the quotient of those two polynomials. So we find, if we want to find where the plus or minus sign changes, we find where these top and bottom polynomials, top and bottom polys, have real zeros. Okay, That's all we need to do. And those will give us candidates, at any rate, for where the original function, the quotient, the rational function, will switch between positive and negative. So let's see what we got. We've got x minus 1 and x plus 2. So let's set each of them equal to 0. So we'll have x minus 1 equals 0, or x plus 2 equals 0. Over here, that gives us x equals 1. So that is a legitimate split point. Notice that over here, however, x equal minus 2 has already been eliminated because we discard this. It is not in the domain of x. So this is not going to be a split point. However, this will be a split point. And that may be a point of interest. But it's not going to be a point where the function will change from positive to negative, which is, our, fin which is our, our primary interest at this point. So it's time, once again, to construct a chart, as we did with other functions in the last two segments. So let's do that here. We write the function up here in the corner. f of x is x minus 1 over x plus 2, and we're interested in where it's positive. And I'll draw my little chart here, spread this across. And I'm marking the two points that we discovered. Now, I know that minus 2 is not a place where it changes, but it is a point where something interesting happens, so let's mark it down. In fact, let me go ahead and mark these down at the bottom. 
f of x equals 0 for x equals 1, because x equals 1 was a split point. x equal minus 1 is a place where f of x is undefined. So the, the function isn't even defined there. There's a hole in the function at that point. OK. Well, as before, I'm going to go into each of these regions. There are three of them again. And pick an easy test point, and I'll just put it up here so I don't forget. Minus 3. Between minus 2 and 1, of course, is my favorite point, 0. And above 1, I'll choose an easy one like 2. And then here, instead of looking at a product of, by, of uh, linear factors or other factors, I'm looking at a quotient, but the principle is still the same. Let's look at x minus 1. I guess I don't need the parentheses there. x minus 1 with a minus 3 in it will be negative. And then x plus 2 with a minus 3 in it will also be negative. Together, negative times negative, actually it's negative over negative, will give me a function that is positive. So f of x will be positive there. In here, x minus 1 with 0 in there, of course, is less than 0. x plus 2 with 0 in there is greater than 0. Together, or dividing a negative by a positive gives us a negative f of x is less than 0. And over here, x minus 1 for 2 is greater than 0. x plus 2 with 2 in there, of course, is also greater than 0. And uh, positive over a positive makes f of x greater than 0. So now remember, we were looking for where the quotient here, the f of x, is greater than or equal to 0. So it's greater than 0 here. The point on the end is not included because the function's undefined. So it's open there and goes this way forever. This point is included. We are interested in that point. And then we go to the right forever. So schematically, we already see what our intervals are. And we can write exactly what they are. This is the interval from minus infinity to minus 2, not including minus 2. Or x is in the interval from, let's see, we are including 1, so it's square brackets 1, all the way out to the right, which is infinity. And there we have it. We have now discovered the intervals upon which this rational function is greater than or equal to 0. OK. Well, before I do a graph of this, I want to mention one technical note. This is something that happens with graphing calculators that you should be aware of. So technical note. You may. You may need to graph rational functions, or at least some rational functions, graph rational functions in what's called dot mode, where the calculator produces a series of dots in each column of pixels that will make up the function, rather than what's called connected mode, where the calculator, or the computer for that matter, where the graphing device tries to connect the dots and run little lines between them. Now, what that means is, pictorially, if I can give you some idea here, meaning you'll have the dot picture versus the connected picture. So this will be the dot, and this will be the connected picture. And here's what might happen. You might have, if you do it with dots, have a rational function that looks like this in a graph, where there's a place here where the rational function has what we'll later call an asymptote, a line that's vertical that it approaches from both sides, as you see here, but doesn't actually ever touch. Now, in dot mode, this is the kind of picture you'll get in that case. In the connected mode, sometimes you will get not only the two curves as they would be if they were connected, but you'll also get something like that happen. Now, this is wrong. But what the calculator is doing in trying to connect all the dots, it's trying to connect the dot from the very bottom here to the very top there. Of course, in the function, there is no such connection. But the calculator thinks there ought to be. And sometimes we'll draw a line on there that is really not part of the graph. So when you're doing that, just be careful. Be sure you know what your function ought to look like so that when you get something like this that is incorrect, you'll recognize it. OK, for this particular function here, f of x, remember, was x minus 1 over x plus 2. And we were solving this 
for where it was greater than or equal to zero. And if you look on the interval on the window from minus 5 to 5 by minus 8 to 8, here is the picture that you get. My calculator, as it turns out, I did not have to, for this rational function, turn it into dot mode. Mine worked perfectly fine without it. And here's what I got. Here was minus 2. And I'll go ahead and dot this in by hand. And I'll mark it. This was dotted in by hand. This dot, these series of vertical dots did not appear in the calculator. But I wanted to show you that so that it will allow me to draw this correctly. And here is the point 1, which was, remember, the only split point that we found. And here is minus 2, where there seems to be a line that the rational function approaches on either side but never touches. As I said, later we'll discuss this in the next unit. We'll call them asymptotes, and uh, we'll find out how to get them and what to do with them. So this is dotted line drawn in by hand. You might want to do this sometimes just to make things clear. And remember the intervals. Remember we had the interval that was open and going forever, and then starting here at 1, including 1 and going forever to the right. It's appropriate to bring this up. This will turn up in the next example. A fact, remember, is just my version of the word for theorem. If a and b are greater than or equal to 0, then what can you say? These numbers are positive or 0. What can you conclude? Well, if it so happens that a is less than or equal to b, then, in fact, it is equivalent to saying the square root of a is less than or equal to the square root of b. Those are positive square roots, of course. Now, I'm not going to prove this, so the proof is omitted here. There will be proofs coming up, certainly in the next unit, but this is not one that I'll do here. And what it says is, if the two numbers are positive, or 0, then taking square roots of both sides is legitimate. If they're not positive or 0, there's no such rule. So, with that fact in mind, it'll turn up in the next problem. Let me pose you a problem that I'll give you some time to work on. Here it is. It is a problem from physics. The problem goes like this. An object is dropped from the roof of a 150-foot tall building. After t seconds, it will be, and we're given a distance formula, 150 minus 16 t squared feet above the ground. On what interval of time, so this is a time interval we're looking for here, will the object be between 54 and 118 feet above the ground? So this is an inequality, of course, between 54 and 118 feet will be an inequality. You also note that the English word between is not clear. It may mean, perhaps, that we are strictly between 54 and 118 and don't include them, or sometimes it, it's meant to include the two endpoints. In any case, how do we solve this? Well, I'll give you some time now to look at it. And when I come back, I will show you what I did. Okay, now we're going to look at the solution to that physics problem. And as always with these uh, problems that involve the real world, it's probably wise to draw a picture to illustrate all the things involved. And your first picture may not be clear enough, so you may have to fiddle a bit to come up with one that's clear. Let me show you what I've got here. This line will represent the ground. Of course, mathematical ground is always nice and straight. And let me imagine that this is the building. This up here is the roof of the building. So here's the building. Keep in mind what I've got here. I am told that this is 150 feet tall. That was given in the statement of the problem. Now, I'm interested in knowing a certain uh, region of time for when this object is falling. So I'm going to indicate a few notes here. That point there will be the object at time t equals 0. Now, when you're starting a problem, you assume that the time is 0 when the problem starts. OK. Now, somewhere down here, this will be the 
object at uh, any time t, some arbitrary time t. And then the distance of that object from the ground is that distance there. This is the distance that we are given a formula for. Okay, in fact, this is the 150 minus 16t squared formula that we were given. Okay, now in this height between 150 and 0 feet, somewhere in here is 118 feet, and then below it somewhere is 54 feet. And we are interested in the times t equal what to t equal what? This interval is what we are looking for. Okay, I have a schematic diagram now. Now let me continue writing down what I know. This distance formula we can write down as follows. We use S for distance because that's the traditional letter here. Let S be the distance. And what distance is it? It's the distance above ground. You know, it pays in these problems to indicate more than just the bare information that this is a distance. What distance are we talking about? It could be the distance from the top of the roof to where the, the object is. So it probably pays to go ahead and indicate what distance you're talking about. Be a little specific. It can't hurt. Let S be the distance above ground. Then we are given a formula for the distance above ground. S, and that will depend upon time, so it's a function of time is 150 minus 16 t squared. Now that's given information. Also, as I noted in the picture, we begin at time t equals 0 and therefore, and so, t is greater than or equal 0 always. So throughout this problem, t is always greater than or equal to 0 because we're starting with 0 and we're moving forward in time. Okay, now that we've got all the information that was given to us in the problem, including a nice picture written down, we can now ask the question that the problem poses, this part up here in the corner. Let's write that out as an inequality because we're doing inequalities after all. So the question is, for what times t, or values for t, or numbers for t, will we have the following inequality? The s of t, which is the distance of that object from the ground, when will that be greater than or equal to 54 and less than or equal to 118? Now, since I don't know whether between means the strict inequality or the one including the endpoints, I'm going to include the endpoints. It can't hurt. If someone really wants the strict one, we can remove those at another time. So here is the question I want to solve. Well, I have a formula for s of t, so let's go ahead and write that down. See where that leads. 54 less than or equal to 150 minus 16t squared less than or equal to 118. Ah, now I'm on my way. I see what I want to do. I'm going to take the 150 here and subtract it throughout. Now, adding or subtracting a number doesn't change the direction of inequalities. On the left, I'll get a minus 96 less than or equal to minus 16t squared less than or equal to a minus 32. Now, I don't like having all those minuses, but what I'm going to do is get rid of the minus 16 by multiplying by minus 116. Now, that is less than 0. So when I multiply by this number, it will certainly get rid of the minus 16, but I have to remember it's going to change the direction of both my inequalities. So if I multiply minus 1 one sixteenth by 96, I'll let you do the calculation. It turns out to be 6. The direction of the inequality changes. I'll circle that. The inside, of course, by design is just t squared. The next inequality also changes direction. And multiplying minus 32 by minus 1 sixteenth leaves me with 2. So I have t squared caught between 6 and 2. I don't like the order, though. So I'm going to reverse the order. And why would I want to do that? And why should you probably do that? Well, because generally we read numbers from smaller to larger, going from left to right. So I would prefer to have my inequalities going that way. So if I do that, I will now have 2 less than or equal to t squared. That's how the one on the right moves over. Less than or equal to 6. Okay? So I'm stopping at this point for just a moment. t 
squared is now caught between 2 and 6. That's great. I also want you to remember that we said that t is always greater than or equal to 0. Okay? Now, I'm going to use a fact here. Because you see, I have a t squared here. And how do I undo t squared to get at t? I want to take the square root. Well, in order for the square root to be legitimate throughout and preserve the inequalities, the only theorem I have is the fact that I wrote up earlier. That is to say, the fact that says if all the numbers are positive, and see they are, 2, t squared, and 6, and t even, are all positive, or possibly 0, then I can take the square root throughout. So, since 2, t squared, and 6 all are greater than or equal to 0, by the fact, which I had written up earlier, we can take square roots. And so I do so. And I get square root of 2 less than or equal to t less than or equal to square root of 6. So what have I got? This all is in seconds. So I know that when t is between square root of 2 seconds, and square root of 6 seconds, then the distance will between, be between that 54 feet and that 118 feet. Well, square root of 2 and square root of 6 are not very enlightening. I prefer in, these, in this case to have a decimal. So if I approximate this, approximately this means that t is between 1.41 truncating square root of 2 again and 2.44 truncating that one. So if I'm happy with this, in an approximation, then that's where I could end this problem. However, let me point out something. You ought to know what truncation does. It, it does something different every time. Let me show you what it does in this particular problem. This is just an observation so that you don't start thinking that your approximate intervals are the same as your exact intervals. Let's just make an observation, observe. Here is the real number line. And here is square root of 2, and here, say, is square root of 6. Now, this is the correct or the true interval. This is the true interval. Maybe I'll put the word exact there also. True or exact interval. And if you approximate each of these, you'll see that square root of 6 is approximately 2.4 4, 9, 4, etc. Square root of 2 is approximately 1.4142, etc. Now, what does our approximate interval look like compared to the true interval? Well, in fact, 1.41 is less than this number, so 1.41 perhaps is there. 2.44, the truncated version, is less than this number, so that might be there, say. And what we have here is this is the approximated interval. As opposed to the exact interval. And notice, it has been shifted, in this case, to the left. So that's what's happened. So if you want to be really careful, you ought to realize that all the points in this interval down here that are down here are wrong, aren't they? because they are below square root of 2. So they are wrong. And you are now missing all of these points which are correct. So that's what happens when you truncate and when you approximate in general. You end up with something which is close to what you want, but may not be exactly what you want. So you need to be aware of that. OK. Now it's time to pause, and we'll come back with another segment.